Hello, my name is Eric Zawalski. Uh, this playlist is designed to bring you on board and introduce you to using LAMPS software to conduct molecular dynamics simulations. Uh, in this playlist, we're going to walk you through a basic LAMPS script. We're going to show you how to use PACMOL to set up the initial position of molecules in a simulation domain. And we're going to walk you through how to set up your credentials and install the LAMPS software on the Amos supercomputer, which is uh, specific to you folks at Rensselaer. Uh, in this particular video, we're just going to go over the motivations for conducting a molecular dynamics simulation, you know, what molecular dynamics is, and we're going to talk about how a simulation inter models the interaction between pairs of particles on a massive scale. We're going to introduce the concept of a thermodynamic ensemble, uh, which comes from statistical mechanics. And finally, we're going to look at some of the applications where we can take these concepts and apply them in a LAMPS script. So what is LAMPS? Uh, well, it's an acronym. It stands for Large Scale Atomic Molecular Massively Parallel Simulation. And it's a very popular software. It was developed uh, at Sandia National Laboratory. Its main uh, purpose is to model solid state systems and materials, but it has been expanded over the years to simulate a variety of conditions, including biomolecules, polymers, uh, colloidal solutions, and systems at the meso and continuum scale, in addition to the micro scale. Um, it's got a growing user base, so you'll be able to find a lot of material out there from people who have used it in the past. I highly encourage you throughout your tenure on this project to go visit the LAMPS website, use the documentation there, and look at other people's work from, uh, you know, from their research from other schools uh, and other laboratories. So, What's our motivation for using simulation in molecular dynamics research? Um, you probably are familiar with the fact that there's an iterative process in research that goes between analytical models and experiments. You use uh, known equations uh, to develop an analytical model for your system. And then uh, based on that model, you conduct an experiment, you get the data and you compare with your analytical model. You may go back, refine the model, conduct another simulation, and so on until you get results that are satisfactory for your purposes. Simulation bridges the gap between experimental methods and analytical methods. Uh, it's more powerful than analytical methods, and it's also safer and cheaper than experimental methods, uh, particularly in a nuclear application, for example. You're really taking those uh, known models that you used for your analytical solution and applying them over and over again to get a more accurate picture of what an experiment might look like. And it's becoming more popular all the time. The more computing power there is and the cheaper that that computing power is for researchers at a variety of institutions. So what is a molecular dynamic simulation? At a most basic level, we're just applying F equals MA over and over again for you know, hundreds of thousands of time steps sometimes. Um, the images you see on the screen now were produced by a research team at Sandia, and you'll see a few such images in this show. This is demonstrating fracture mechanics at a micro scale. And Again, this is a dynamic simulation. So when you have a force applied at a specific region, what happens to all the individual particles? Where do they go? How do they interact with the other particles? Uh, we're applying F equals MA at scale over many time steps to figure that out. That's not just force balancing. Energy minimization is another application of molecular dynamic simulation where we try to minimize the potential energy uh, associated with the interactions of all of these particles, again, in an iterative fashion. So speaking of uh, energy potential for particles, let's look at maybe one of the most basic particle-particle interactions. And this is 
the Leonard Jones potential. It's basically the archetypical model for intermolecular reactions. Um, it states that the potential energy for a two particle system is a function of the distance between those two particles. And left to their own devices, uh, a system of two particles will equilibrate into a lowest energy configuration. Um, I like to start by looking at the graph here on the right hand side because it shows. Uh, if, well, let's, let's look at the right hand side here. We have this asymptotic behavior uh, as distance goes to infinity, where the energy potential between those particles gets closer and closer to zero. So there's basically no interaction between those particles. But as we bring the particles closer together, you see that uh, dips a little bit into this negative energy region. It's a little under equilibrium. That represents an attractive force between those two particles. And as we get closer and closer, that attractive force becomes quite strong until we pass through this cusp. And then gradually, this repulsive force starts to take over. And if we get too close, the repulsive force gets very strong and compels those particles to fly apart. So you have the long range where there's an energy e equilibrium where there's basically no interaction. And then at the rather short range, you have a very small region where the energy is minimized at zero. Uh, let's, let's, let's dig a little bit more deeply into the equation that describes this motion. Um, I like this graph because you can see that the repulsive and attractive forces are modeled by the two specific terms in the Leonard Jones potential. And it's sometimes called the 12 six potential. The uh, repulsive force is modeled by this term to the 12th power. And you can imagine as this uh, separation distance gets below the um, this is, uh, parameter sigma, which you can think of as the size of a particle, you know, these these particles get too close, that fraction or that ratio rather uh, starts to blow up. And so you get that very strong repulsive force. But as we get farther out and the radius is much larger than that uh, equilibrium distance, that size of the particle, um, the sixth power term takes over. You can see that uh, summing together here. Um, I want to tell you right now, uh, understanding this model is not necessary, at least not in uh, intimate detail. This is just one type of uh, interaction model for particles. And depending on your needs, um, you know, your simulation may be better modeled by a different potential interaction. And even so, understanding the intimate details of how that potential model works may not be necessary. But at least here you have the broad brushstrokes of what a basic interaction is between two particles. Let's do another broad brushstroke here. Let's let's look at statistical mechanics. Um, you don't again don't need to know an awful lot about statistical mechanics other than that a system of particles can be in infinitely many states. What does that mean? If you look back at your previous coursework, like thermodynamics and any other similar discipline. We basically describe systems in terms of their extrinsic properties. So that would be things like the temperature, the pressure, and the density. Um, the total energy of a system is another extrinsic property that we look at. But the motion and location of specific, specific particles in that system is not explicitly defined in terms of those extrinsic properties. Statistical mechanics describes these things in a probabilistic way. What's the probability that a particle is in a given place at a given time? Or what's the distribution of possible locations for a, different, for a specific particle given a set of extrinsic properties? Um, if we choose those extrinsic properties and hold them constant, the collection of all possible states of a system under those properties is called the thermodynamic ensemble. And we can go into a little more detail about some of the types of ensembles that you might find and might use in a molecular dynamics simulation. And we're going to consider them uh, by analogy with a laboratory beaker full of some solution with some different conditions, as you can see by these images at the bottom of the screen. Let's move on. One 
ensemble is called the micro canonical ensemble. You can often find it referred to as the NVE ensemble. And that indicates that we are holding constant the number of particles in the system, the volume or the density of the system, and the total energy of the system, so NVE. Um, by analogy, this can be thought of as a beaker of solution adiabatically insulated and totally sealed from the environment. So it's an isolated system, no mass flow, no energy flux. This model is pretty useful for modeling constant energy surfaces. It's also useful for performing energy minimization in a simulation. So what we talked about with the Leonard-Jones potential, how the distance between two particles um, represents a potential energy we would like to minimize that energy by allowing the radius to settle into a system where that potential energy is zero. So an NVE ensemble could be useful for that. Let's also look at the isothermal isobaric ensemble, also called the NPT. And you might be guessing by now, uh, we are holding constant the number of particles, the pressure of the system, and the temperature of the system. And so with our beaker analogy, once again, uh, this beaker is not insulated, so it's at temperature equilibrium with the environment. And this piston uh, seal on the top uh, maintains that there's no mass flow, um, but it allow and it also allows the pressure to remain constant. So if there were to be an increase in the energy of the system, you know, think of an ideal gas. You know, you increase the energy of the system and you might want to uh, allow that uh, system to increase in volume in order to allow that pressure to be equal. Um, this is useful for chemical reactions because we see a change in the molecular structure, we see a change in the energy of the system due to the chemical reaction, uh, and we want to allow the volume to change to act and model that system. We can also think about the isenthalpic isobaric ensemble, which is similar to before, but this time we're holding the enthalpy constant. Enthalpy, if you'll recall from thermodynamics, is the sum of the internal energy for a system plus the pressure volume work. So here we are adiabatically insulated, unlike the previous example. This model, or rather this ensemble, is useful for modeling vapor compression, uh, liquid vapor, two-phase mixtures, and it's also useful for modeling uh, systems that are near the supercritical state. Uh, which is where the phases of matter, liquid, uh, solid, or vapor, uh, the, the distinction between these phases is not very clearly defined. And if you know anything about what it takes, the, the conditions to uh, impose a supercritical state on a system, that's very difficult to control and very expensive to produce. So this is a perfect example of something where a simulation might offer a cost savings benefit and a number of iterations benefit over an actual experimental setup. So let's apply some of this to a LAMPS application. You'll see more of the syntax and structure of a script uh, in a subsequent video. But just to give you a taste right now, let's look at these snips of code. Uh, the first snip on the top here, uh, first line reads pair style LJ slash cut slash tip 4p slash long. So from this line, the letters LJ, that refers to the Leonard Jones potential. And I know from my past experience that the tip 4p Ewald water model for um, the interaction of water molecules with other molecules uh, makes use of the Leonard Jones potential in modeling that interparticle interaction. Um, you'll also see the case based style um, this means that at long range, you know, on that long tail of the Leonard Jones graph that we looked at, there's a different uh, uh, model being used to uh, determine the interactions between particles. And that's partly for computational efficiency. Um, you see these bond style and angle style parameters are harmonic. That is a different model than the Leonard Jones potential. If you'd like to know more about that, you can certainly look at the documentation. This is all very specific to the TIP 4P water model, so your applications may call for different parameters. Um, looking at this second SNP here, uh, fix number one, 
is an NVE ensemble. So when this fix is called, uh, like a function is called in other programming languages, um, it's going to impose that NVE ensemble on the system, which is defined as water in this case. Um, this other line um, is a, dip, a separate fix, which applies a Langevin thermostat when it is called in the simulation. Um, we didn't talk about thermostats before, but you'll see in the literature and in different models that you're trying to employ in your simulation, things like thermostats and barostats are just algorithms that you can apply to control the temperature and pressure, respectively, of a system. And this has a variety of functions that are beyond the scope of this video. Um, again, looking at this third SNP, this is a different fix one, but it uses an NPT ensemble. Um, and I also happen to know from experience that the, that the second SNP here, you know, this was used for energy equilibration of a system, you know, get, getting it to sort of a steady state to initialize a simulation. And then this second call uh, with the NPT ensemble is used to actually run the simulation and get data. Um, finally, looking at this fourth SNP, um, this uh, fix is called constraint and it uses the shake algorithm to determine the separation distance between hydrogen and oxygen atoms in a water molecule. Um, again, this is specific to the TIP 4P water model, and it's just an example of how every model has you know, specified parameters, specified algorithms that need to be used. Again, look at the documentation. You will find treasure trove of information and any question that you might want to have answered for your application, it's probably there. So what are my recommendations for success? Uh, you know, a really smart fellow uh, told me this semester, you have to lean into the project. Um, your other undergraduate coursework is highly focused on deliverables and deadlines. It's very highly structured, but research is not that way. It's much more open-ended. Um, because there's so much that you could learn, um, and, and because it's so open-ended, you really have to learn as you go. You can't learn too much up front, otherwise you, know, you may not have time. <laughs> so be sure to learn as you go. There's no roadmap to success, but there are a lot of people who have tried what you've tried or what you are trying now. They tried it before. So follow in their footsteps and look at what they've done. Um, good communication, of course, always a plus for any team. So make sure that you're getting and receiving feedback from your teammates and try not to go too far down any rabbit holes without really being able to apply that knowledge to the problem at hand. And as always, don't forget to use your resources here at the Institute. This is just a you know, limited set of the resources, the human resources, you might say, um, that I had available in my team on this project. Uh, there's a lot of other people on this campus who are using LAMPS. You might be surprised to find out. So even if it's not the same application that you have, don't be afraid to reach out and make new friends and um, see what other kind of issues other people are running into. We're going to continue with this playlist. I hope you stick around for the next video. We're going to see Malcolm Porterfield going through a LAMPS script, showing off in more detail what the syntax is for a water benchmarking simulation script, a relatively simple example. He's also going to show you how to set up a simulation domain with water molecules using the PacMol software. Uh, and we're also going to hear from Gavin DeVincent. He's going to show you what it's like to interface with the Amos supercomputer here at the Institute and is going to walk you through how to set up your credentials for the simulation and how to get the LAMP software installed on the supercomputer. I thank you very much for tuning in and I wish you success. Thank you.